Hello, I'm Michael Hashi, and uh, I'm the instructor of uh, Painting One. Let me give you a little bit of an outline of, of what this course is about, and my teaching philosophy, and some pointers about uh, how your, your your attitude can be can be successful in this class. Uh, it's Painting One, which means that it's a, an intro class, uh, which which really has no presuppositions, no no ideas about what your experience is before. Those of you who've had experience in art, those of you who are art concentrators or majors. Uh, a welcome minors, those who uh, who really uh, have been into art before, are welcome and will work at that level. Those of you who are uh, new and fulfilling the, the three credit uh, creative arts distribution are welcome as well. Um, my particular philosophy in doing this intro class is the, that I'd rather give you a buffet, in other words, a sequence of different kinds of things to to do, as opposed to, to doing one particular thing through the semester uh, that would be improved and perfected uh, in a in an end to the nth degree. So uh, I also find that that particular uh, way of working allows you to hook into something that that uh, it, it hooks into your particular way of expressing yourself. It becomes a kind of surprising interest for you, and uh, and is something to take away. You know, after this course is uh, is completed, so, uh, let's talk a little bit about the first assignment. Uh, I used to have people do a kind of mechanical eleven-step grade chart uh, that was kind of frustrating for your first assignment, and I decided to free it up a little bit more by having you mix as many kinds of grays, blacks, and whites, as many kinds of what's called in art values, achromatic values. Achromatic meaning no color, values meaning uh, dark and light. So fancy words for lots of grays and a few blacks and whites in there for, for contrast. Uh, this is an example of one I just did. Again, your, pa your painting, uh, your canvas uh, pad rectangle is going to be a little bit bigger than this, and I would actually recommend that you cut it down a little bit. It's 14 by 20 uh, in your canvas pad. I would go 14 by 16 and maybe a little bit smaller. It's up to you. You can do it with ruler and scissors, exacto knife. You can you can cut it down a little bit, not to waste canvas, but I don't want you to waste paint, which is more expensive. So in this first assignment, this is only one example of a of, a, of an infinite number of kinds of things you can do. It's not uh, it's not a, a geometric grid, although that's possible, as you'll see in some of the examples. Uh, it is simply a mixture of grays and a few blacks and whites thrown in uh, on the palette and then applied as a kind of um, mosaic, a kind of uh, map, a kind of, uh, of field of different contrasts. So rather than, than, quite frankly, most of you will end up painting, and we all end up painting realistic still lifes and, and more, um, more traditional sorts of paintings, in this first assignment, I'm, I'm having you not worry about getting the apple to look like the apple or some sort of still life or realistic thing look realistic, but just to get the material down as a kind of muscle memory in your, in your, in your craft. So mixing on the palette, placing things on uh, the canvas, and uh, I would, if you're going to do something this, shall we say, this allegedly chaotic, okay, it's not terribly it's not geometric. It's not. Uh, it's not planned out. I think if you're, you're after the contrast to really, to really challenge yourself, without preconditions, I would do like, small clusters, that are separate. I would do small neighborhoods, little little molecules, of maybe a dozen or so, well, eight to a dozen or so colors, that then get connected by other things that you paint in between. And you're always sort of thinking that this is not a pre-planned thing, but it has a kind of, of disorderly evenness about it. It has a kind of what's called a field quality. It's an energetic set of contrasts that really is the most, to me, the most pleasurable and the, most, and the least painful way to get into the technique of using the acrylic paint and to begin to push your perception, which is one of the great objectives of this class, to get your perception to perceive where things might be balanced, where things might be organized, where things might be placed, to make a, an interesting and energetic uh, field. And you'll have more examples of this as we get on.
there are other possibilities. These are all your um, individual choices in terms of direction. As long as you come up with uh, an inventory of lots of different uh, uh, contrasts of grays, blacks, and whites, you're in business. So this one becomes a little bit more geometric. It's not precise. It's not necessarily mechanical, but uh, there is a kind of uh, joyful patterning going on here, a kind of decoration uh, 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 pattern that, that is uh, that is a good format for um, the grays that we're talking about. Of course, with this kind of thing, you end up with, with a kind of re repetition that might limit the numbers of things that you're doing. But nonetheless, I think it works for this, this particular assignment. Here's one that is more, even more precise and not necessarily more organized, but, but certainly one that, that gives you a, uh, almost a musical, vibratory um, a mosaic of, of casual geometric shapes. And there are two ways to go about this, which I'll demonstrate in, with the materials in a minute. Uh, you can either be very careful about, about, about uh, uh, filling in the edges of these things, or you can actually, if you want to make it really precise, you can actually tape them. And I'll show you how to do that uh, um, in, in a bit. Another one here, where it's very well organized, it could be a kind of electronic grid. Uh, and you're welcome to do a kind of graphics equalizer, uh, musical, uh, visual interpretation here. Uh, this to me is almost like electronic music, where there's a there's an almost a vibratory, back and forth uh, pulsing of grays. So even though we're dealing with grays, even though we're dealing with at this point, at this very beginning point, with almost non-color and the simplest kind of contrasts of black and white, uh, you still have the the potential of real creativity and invention. Uh, here's a painting from a while back that I, I actually did. Uh, I did a number of uh, striped paintings of various kinds of colors. This one here was the only achromatic black and, and white. But you can see how without being fussy with tape, without being uh, worried about geometric uh, um, shapes, that you could almost do a, a kind of cake frosting a uh, set of bars, a set of set of stripes, set of uh, thick, opaque uh, shapes that that would give you tremendous subtle and very um, uh, strong contrasts of grays, blacks, and whites. Regardless of what kind of experience you've had with acrylics before, what I'd like to do is to show you some some basic materials we're going to work with. For the most part through the semester, you're going to be working on uh, what are, many of you know, canvas boards. It's a rigid cardboard that's been uh, laminated to, uh, to a canvas that's been gessoed. And it has several advantages. One, you can work as wet as you want. You can work as piled up and, uh, and uh, thick as you want. Uh, you can use, use it uh, as a rigid surface which can be held in your lap uh, on an easel if you have one or uh, taped to a piece of cardboard and or drawing board. So it's a very flexible um, uh, mobile surface on which to paint and it should take any sorts of, uh, of uh, acrylic styles and, uh, and techniques uh, very well. The sizes of these uh, canvas boards that you'll be working with will range from 11 by 14 to uh, 16 by 20 inches. Also in your kit is a palette pad, okay? This one here, dip disposable palette pad. And although there are many uh, uh, materials and surfaces you can use to mix uh, acrylics and oils, this one's really efficient because uh, it's obvious that you can tear it off and throw it away once you've done. Okay, um, it is uh, the kind of thing that you, don't, you that you're keeping the pad to, you're keeping the pad together uh, as you're mixing. In other words, unlike, unlike the canvas uh, uh, pad, you are keeping these in here as you mix painting by painting because that gives you a more stable surface on which to mix. And of course, you'll be mixing uh, with what in your kit is a kind of white plastic knife. This kind of instrument right here. Uh, it's called a palette knife, and uh, I'll get into the details of that more when we begin uh, mixing the actual acrylics uh, to, to apply paint. Uh, we're going to start off with the first assignment with just a straight uh, titanium white and a Payne's gray, essentially a black and a white. Uh, they're good ones to start with because when you put them out on the palette and begin mixing them, uh, you'll realize how 
differently acrylic paints can proportionally mix together. For instance, if you, if you were just using a logical um, reasoning, you'd think that you know, an equal amount of black and an equal amount of white might give you um, a middle gray. Well, especially with the Payne's gray and especially with the ivory black, the other blacks that you have in acrylics, uh, it's a situation whereby uh, the black is much more powerful, and uh, we'll get into that as we mix. The other thing that I would recommend you're getting, it's not in your kit, but if you can find yourself a spray bottle, okay, it, doesn't, it can be as big and heavy duty as, say, something like a cleaner spray bottle, as long as it has an adjustable a nozzle whereby you can make a fine spray. The finer the spray, the better. Um, the, you can buy them in art supply stores, but they're awfully expensive for what they are. Uh, drug stores, makeup counters, uh, hardware stores might have them at a much cheaper, um, much cheaper price. And all of you who've painted with acrylics probably get a little bit frustrated with how, how, how quickly they dry. And the, the thing about this strange thing that's not included in your kit that you're going to have to scrounge somewhere is that if you keep misting the palette itself, especially with the fine mist, and if you keep misting as you're painting a painting, miss the, the actual surface of the painting as you're applying uh, paint, things stay much more workable, they do not dry as quickly, and it becomes a little bit more like, uh, like an oil painting. The other things that uh, you'll have on, on hand, obviously, are the brushes. Okay, You've, I, I would use for this first assignment and through many of the assignments, the number four flat top brush, the square top brush. You have a small packet of brushes that uh, are of reasonably good quality, and they, um, they, they should serve you well as bristle brushes. They're a little bit stiffer than, than watercolor brushes. So spray bottle, uh, palette knife, brushes, pad, canvas, acrylics. Uh, get yourself a plastic container. What really works if you don't want to carry around or work with uh, glass is a, is a large yogurt container, but any kind of plastic container that can be filled uh, about two-thirds of the way up with, uh, with water will be fine. And always have on hand some paper towels, uh, things to wipe your, your brushes and your palette knife as you're, as you're uh, working along here. So acrylic paint, um, let's start mixing with the palette knife. And this may be a little bit different from what most of you have experienced. But uh, instead of mixing with your brushes, I want you to get initially uh, used to the idea that you should mix with a palette knife. And I've sprayed this, this palette a little bit to make it more workable. I'll do it again with the acrylic paint. And what t people tend to do when they start out with, the, with this kind of mixing is to use stirring like a martini or some kind of uh, drink, whereby they're using just the, the point of the palette knife to get the stuff mixed. That's, that's awfully inefficient and uh, kind of too delicate to make it work workable. Think of a plow. Think of a, plow, a snow plow. Think of using the, the uh, palette knife as a kind of surface that pushes the the paints that are being mixed up into a mountain, up into a, up into a volume, and then gets crushed right down. That gives you a very quick and efficient mixture of paint. Okay, um, and if you, you your palettes are t are going to be a little bit smaller than this one, so you don't have all of the space in the world to mix. But if you can keep your each of your colors in a kind of pile, in a kind of um, of uh, a mound here, and you pr push them to the center and crush them, push them to the center and crush them, uh, you'll, you'll mix very efficiently and, uh, and, and, uh, and successfully. So when you're applying the paint okay, with the brush, I dip your brush in the water first just to moisten it to make it more workable. You're not doing it loaded with water like a watercolor brush. But I would make it more pliable, would make it more amenable to the acrylic, since the acrylic is water soluble, by dipping it into the into the water. So I'm going to load the the brush with paint. There are many techniques to use in terms of painting uh, with brushes, with palette knives, with uh, all sorts of instruments. But we're going to start with basics here, where you're loading the brush, and if you want the paint to go on relatively smoothly, so I'm going to moisten this one a little bit. Okay and see that uh, with application of the paint, you end up with a 
fairly opaque, in other words, not transparent uh, color. Okay, and especially for our first assignment, you want these things to be reasonably uh, thick so that you're not doing a kind of wash like in watercolor. That is a technique in acrylic whereby you can use more uh, watery sorts of things to make more delicate uh, veils like watercolor. But for this particular first assignment, I'm really interested in your getting a kind of opaque, uh, solid, not see-through sort of, um, of, uh, of, of paint surface. Now I'm going to, if I'm going to keep my colors somewhat uh, manageable, I'm going to rinse the brush thoroughly in the water, wipe it off with the towel, uh, keep it in the water for pliability, uh, and go on to mixing my, my, next, uh, my next color. I'm going to go for another darker gray here. You can arrange them pretty much the way you want. I, I find that because the acrylics dry relatively quickly, uh, you don't want to put out a, a lot, okay, uh, at first until you get used to them. So let's just try to make this gray a little bit darker. And you can see how this small amount of black, you know, makes the white fairly dark. And again, I'm plowing and crushing, plowing and crushing, plowing and crushing, pushing it down. If it gets a little bit stiff, it gets a little bit uh, uh, granular and dried, uh, keep using your light spray to keep it more workable. And since I've, I've cleaned my brush, I can use it to then apply the next, uh, the next color. Now you can, with, with other kinds of painting, you're going to be mixing them on the canvas itself. You're going to be doing a lot more experimental things, things that are not as, as separate and sort of self-conscious as this first assignment, which I'll talk about in a bit. But we're, we're just laying in colors to compare and contrast. So let me now demonstrate uh, the painting in of these neighborhoods of color contrasts. So for the more organic uh, field of, of colors, instead of moving from one side to another, filling it in like, uh, like some sort of advancing uh, mold in your refrigerator from the back to the front, uh, I would do clusters. I would do um, what would seem to be relatively solid shapes, but brush strokes that would be um, opaque contrasts of color. In other words, instead of going from one side to the other, filling things in like a kind of advancing army, I would do clusters, um, various sorts of, of, um, of molecules of different components. Each of these neighborhoods, these sort of aggregates of color, contrasts, I uh, should have several different, almost mosaic-like um, elements in them. In other words, do a number of shapes. They needn't be uh, all the same. In fact, they should be, as I try to get this even here, they should be, you know, fairly uh, various and different, but within a kind of family of, of scale, a kind of family resemblance of, of, uh, of shape and, and identity. One that's very close right there. I'll make one that put one in the center. So just organically put this stuff in. Don't worry about any kind of intuitive, or shall we say, don't worry about any kind of pre-planned thing, whereby, and I want to get this a little bit more even, whereby um, you end up with a kind of magnetic filings that are stuck together, okay? Uh, you really want that, that sort of feel. So some could be qu you know, somewhat bigger than others, all right? So that seems to be complex enough to be a kind of component. But then I would, I would jump around. I would imagine these, a good metaphor might be these things being cities uh, or settlements or uh, villages that are in different portions of a territory and that uh, 
and that you're moving around building these in a way that that leaves a lot of vacant space at first but then uh, is again and again and again uh, filled in and uh, and made into something more finished by uh, the process of simply covering the canvas, simply covering the canvas with uh, with as many grays as possible, lights and darks. And you and again I say uh, that you can use, as I said in the text, you can use pure black, pure white from time to time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the whole thing that contrasted, but it would be very good to. Uh, you know, to have those sharp contrasted notes of uh, of things. So I'll put a light gray there, and then maybe beside it, um, I can clean the brush. And you do, you do. Unlike me right now, you do want to clean your water, empty your water, and uh, and use it uh, to to mix. I should always say to to uh, to rinse out the brush. Uh, from time to time, Do, it doesn't matter if there are ridges on the on the brush stroke. In fact, that's kind of juicy and and interesting and expressive. Okay, uh, you are above all making the color as best as possible uh, as solid as possible. Because this particular kind of painting, I'm, I'm really after contrasts and and a kind of uh, delight in uh, there being lots of different things uh, crammed together. So I can keep doing this. I'll do one more, perhaps. You know, uh, jump around and mix more grays. You know, I've I've mixed these few here, and I'm putting them in so that there's a fair amount of of contrast between them. Okay, jump around. You can be much more uh, individual and, and uh, inventive with your particular kinds of shapes. You may make them, uh, you know, more precise, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But if you keep the size, well, with some variety in there, more or less within the same family resemblance of, uh, of scale, uh, you'll be doing well. There's a good black. And while I'm not um, I'm going to continue this forever, uh, you you get the point when you see this next one. Uh, when you see the the example that we started out with, uh, how we're we're in the end getting something that would be that clustered, filled in, and continuous. Now, one of the options that we uh, we talked about. Uh, about this field of, of, of grays is to do something a little bit more geometric. Now this one here I suspect was just carefully done without any kind of taping with a smaller brush as well as the larger brush. So you're welcome to do that as long as each of the shapes is the is the sort of um, continuous opaque uh, uh, value, light, light or dark. If you want to do something that's more precise, like the grid we saw before, uh, you are welcome to tape them uh, you can go to the art supply store. It's not in your kit, but but you can get artist tape, which is kind of expensive, but nonetheless uh, really useful in in taping off the the color. I think a good a good substitute for artist tape that's a lot uh, less expensive are the the tapes that are in Home Depot or Lowe's or your local hardware store that are for interior painting. They're usually blue, and that's okay. But it's a bit of a pain when you when we come to doing a hard edge, uh, full color painting later on in the semester. If you can find the kind of interior uh, paint tape that uh, is in hardware stores, and it's like a, a cream or a gray or a, uh, a light neutral color, you're in better shape. The other thing you can do if you want things to be super uh, uh, precise is that in, in your kit you have something similar to this, not the same brand, but a, a heavy gel medium, okay? 
that is a kind of hair mousse, a kind of goo, a kind of translucent uh, um, additive to the paint that's really, you know, to be added to make the paint have more body and translucency. But for us, uh, in terms of, of being a, a hard-edged painting, uh, you can spread that across the area of the tape between the canvas and the tape, that kind of border. I'm not going to do it now because it has to dry uh, before you use it, but that's one option. If you put that across the tape border and let it dry for a few minutes, it becomes a kind of sealant. The artist tape should, by and large, uh, hold the edge. And I'm going to simply take one of my my colors. I want to make it a single color. Let's get to do something that's a little bit more visible. Uh, take take one of these colors and put it in across this this shape and it's best to sort of move it yes in one direction is possible given the scale but I found that if you if you gently move it in several different directions with the tape you sort of cancel out the textural uh, shine and and uh, reflection and it becomes a more matte uh, color. So what I would do is leave that uh, for about 10 minutes until the, or 15 minutes until the, the color is dried, and then very carefully uh, peel off the tape. And what I've, what I've found is that if you peel it off uh, in a way that's away from the actual shape itself, just go very slowly, make sure it's dried, peel it off so that it's, it's, it's moving away from that edge, you get uh, a fairly precise edge on the on the color that you're doing. So, organic shapes, painterly shapes, texturally textural shapes, shapes that are opaque and solid might even have a kind of brush stroke and uh, and ridge along the edge. Those are fine. Uh, but also, if you want to to be a little bit more technical and and um, and graphically punchy, a hard edged. Um, shapes that have either been meticulously painted up to their borders or using this uh, this particular um, uh, tape technique. The one other thing that I want to mention before I forget it is that with your uh, palette, once you've you've sort of done a painting session, okay, and you've got a significant amount of paint to uh, to to still be used, I would spray that very lightly. Spray that very lightly with your with your spray bottle and then with a roll again not in your in your kit but if you can from home or uh, the grocery store come up with some kind of plastic wrap. I've found that you can save for at least a few days uh, whatever whatever paint you have there. If you lay that plastic wrap on top of the palette and gently um, uh, curve it around the edges so that there's a kind of airtight airtight seal. You've sprayed it first so it's moist under there and you're just putting this on top to hold it. And that should hold it uh, for at least a few days and you're, you're able to not waste a significant amount of paint if you've mixed too much.